this is the best place to stand. Yeah. Mike? Yeah, you good? Well, hey. And the microphone works. So we're live. We're live on YouTube. Brighton Art on YouTube. Wow, for the first time ever. Well, hey. It's, I mean, it's incredible to be back in this room. So three years ago on Monday, we had the very first Brighton R in this room. And quite honestly, we thought about two people would turn up. Um, we had to keep putting the chairs out further and further back because there was such a massive appetite for R in Brighton. Um, if you think three years ago today, that was January 2020, massive appetite for R in Brighton. We thought, yes, let's arrange our second event for April 2020. For some reason, it didn't happen. Um, who knows why? So we had to go virtual, but we kept the community going. It's great to see so many faces back in person tonight. Um, it's also great to know that so many people are watching out there on YouTube, young and old. Um, in particular, the shout out to all of the six-year-olds that are watching on YouTube tonight. Um, there are six-year-olds watching. My son, who is obsessed by R and has been coding in R since he was two, promised me that whilst he was having his dinner tonight, he would be tuning in live on YouTube. So shout out to Nathaniel on YouTube. I know you're watching. I know you're coding. I know you're desperate to finish your dinner so that you can code some more. Um, but great to see people here in person. Great to see people online tuning in as well. We've got a fantastic schedule for you this evening. Just wait for Charlie to wake up in the corner. There we go. So we've got a fantastic schedule. There's a few boring bits, so a few intros that I'll do, uh, and then two brilliant talks. So we've got one from Ethan, who's joining us virtually, uh, and then we'll have Lincoln talking to us about package development as well. Just by way of a few intros and the boring bits and the no heckling and stuff like that. Ooh. There we go. So you can even move on. We can do two slides in one. Uh, fantastic thank you to our sponsors, Silicon Brighton. Honestly, none of this would be possible if it wasn't for all the work that Silicon Brighton put in. They've made sure we got the venue tonight. They've sorted out the food and the drink uh, and, and literally all the marketing. I mean, we just turn up. Honestly, we just turn up. Um, and we're always indebted to Silicon Brighton. For those of you that don't know much about what they do, Alex is sitting there in the corner, and I'm sure you can ask us some questions afterwards. Um, they are a facilitator of more than, I think, 20 meetup groups in Brighton now, uh, including Brighton R, Brighton something else that's got a snake at the end of it that we're not talking about tonight, Brighton Data, and lots of other tech and non-tech meetup groups in the local area. Check out their website. Um, Silicon Brighton is powered by some wonderful supporters, uh, including Data Cove here. So Data Cove is my company, founding director of Data Cove, we're a data and analytics consultancy. We do lots of thing in, things in R and some other language, don't know what it is, um, begins with a P, ends in an N. If anyone knows what that is, then uh, probably you're in the wrong place tonight because we're here to talk about R. But yeah, wonderful sponsors and supporters of Silicon Brighton. If you're not behind the initiative, I would encourage you to go in tomorrow morning, talk to your bosses and say, these guys are rocking it in Brighton. We need to get behind this. Brilliant, brilliant people. Uh, we're also really thankful to our hosts at the Eagle Labs tonight. Uh, and I'd like to invite Rohan up to tell you a little bit more about what the Eagle Labs do. Hello, so I'm Rowan, I'm the lab manager for the uh, Brighton Eagle Labs. So uh, those that don't know Eagle Labs, we're a national network, We've got about 34 active sites now across the country, and we're here to really support the UK entrepreneurial and startup kind of industries within kind of giving you all that you need to support your journey to growth really. So whether that be mentoring, funding, access to kind of accelerator programs, we've got it all really. So yeah, talk to me uh, if you need to know more, but we usually do co-working as well in our locations, but a lot of the time we also do really great things for helping businesses grow. So yeah, if you need to know more, come and see me. Great, yeah, we love the venue here at the Eagle Labs. Uh, just a couple of bits of housekeeping. We are here in person. Um, the R conversation doesn't only have to happen once a quarter when we get together. We have a wonderful Slack channel. So if you fire your phones up at this QR code, which I'm sure works, sometimes it doesn't. And Oscar's always checking them for me, but he's not here tonight. So yeah, if you fire your phones up at the QR code, you can come and join us on Slack. 
and it's blank. The session is being recorded, so if you want to relive the wonderful talks that you're seeing tonight, they will be available on the Silicon Brighton YouTube channel, um, and, and they will be available for you to see and share with other people that couldn't make it tonight. Why would people not want to be here to listen to this fantastic content? Our speakers will be happy to take your questions. We ask that there's no heckling. I'm sure all, everybody loves it when in the middle of their talk, someone screams out, so what did you do about that? So yeah, if we could keep questions for the end and we'll go around with a microphone and put them to our speakers. So we've got two fantastic talks for you tonight. We're going to start with Ethan. Um, Ethan is beaming in virtually this evening. Um, poor chap. He gave this talk at Earl at the R Conference in London last year in September. Um, the talk is fantastic. And he gave this talk just before the coffee break. And he probably thought, I've given my talk. I'm going to go and have a nice cup of coffee and relax now. I've done the hard work. And then the poor guy was cornered by myself and Zach from Data Cove. And we took up his entire coffee break asking him questions about the talk because we thought it was so good. And we thought it was so good that you guys at Brighton R have to see it tonight. So we're going to hand over to Ethan, who's joining us virtually. We are ready indeed. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jeremy. There we go. Through. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to let Ethan have the stage. So let's give it up for Ethan, everybody. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear Jeremy sort of doing the final introductions there. Um, but I assume um, I'm now on for my bit. Um, so I'll just get going. Um, so I'm a data scientist um, and I work at Mediacom. Um, so there's a big long title on the screen there, but essentially I'm going to talk um, about how we can predict the attention on online display adverts within marketing and how we can integrate R and there's going to be a little bit of Python in there um, into that pipeline and use some of these new uh, deep learning uh, technologies. So um, with Mediacom, um, we have a number of offices around the UK. Um, we do um, marketing for lots of big brands. Uh, Mediacom sits within Group M, which is within WPP. Um, you've probably uh, seen an ad that WBP, WPP have um, hosted sometime today. Like maybe you've checked your uh, phone earlier on Facebook. You've probably seen one of those ads. Um, they handle a lot of marketing worldwide. Um, we have some examples of uh, Mediacom adverts around the edge um, and some campaigns. Um, you can see the PlayStation launch there with the different shapes of um, the underground signs. That was a big one. And then we also have the eBay Love Island, which is going on for the last two years. So your guilty pleasure is uh, Love Island. You might have seen some of that like key work going on there. Um, also on the little map in the center, you can see, like I said, where our offices are. I'm currently coming to you from York, so I'm based in the Leeds office, but we do have them around the UK, just unfortunately not in Brighton, I'm afraid. Um, so my team at Mediacom, uh, we work on building apps and dashboards to use within the company that um, planners um, or buyers of media might use to work out what's the best media to buy. So um, you might have questions that uh, in the realm of when might be the best time to put your ad on TV and what might be the best channel. Or you might be asking, how can you increase your brand awareness? Or how do you optimize your campaign while it's still running? Um, and this is a still here taken from our TV optimization tool, TV Boost. Um, which is in answer to the first question about how to optimize the best time to put your TV ad. We've got um, a high tech kind of visualization going on there. But that's the kind of things that we build. But you might notice that all of those questions uh, there are working out how to try and optimize some sort of marketing based on how much you're spending. Um, so a cost put onto TV, um, a cost put into running a campaign, um, but actually, 
when you look at what actually drives um, sales, uh, the different advertising elements, um, the actual creative is almost 50% of a driver towards sales. So no matter how much money you might put in incorrectly targeting the ad correctly or reaching as many people um, or putting it in context, if the ad itself doesn't look uh, very appealing, it doesn't attract the attention, that's not going to stick in your mind. And what makes a good creative and how we can improve creatives is quite a hard thing to understand, especially when I was talking about some of the TV campaigns with the, the eBay Love Island uh, campaign. It's really hard to pin that down. But if we think uh, for a minute about a simpler form of media, um, such as marketing you get on Facebook, like I mentioned originally, or online when you maybe look at the news, you're gonna have um, lots of things all asking for your attention. And the first thing that grabs your attention as you're scrolling down really quickly down your Facebook page is gonna be something that might stick in your mind compared to other things. So that's what we were exploring with the um, attention uh, modeling. So if I move on to that, Basically, if an ad is attracting your attention, then that's uh, going to be useful for the clicks and maybe conversions on that ad. So ordinarily, you might have um, 100 people sit down in a room um, and look at some ads, um, and we might get some eye tracking data using a webcam on where these people look at different ads. And that might look something like these um, images here with the heat maps. Um, on this particular example ad from Cancer Research UK, uh, people might look at the, this man's face and then move down to the text. But you can't do this on a really wide scale and it's also, also quite costly. Um, so these uh, results actually come from three uh, deep learning uh, models that use these real eye tracking data from users um, and they are trained using this data to predict um, these heat maps. So it's called saliency modeling. Um, I can also refer to it as attention modeling. Um, and these three models are based in Python um, and open source widely available. I think deep gaze, you can actually Google, you can put your profile picture through it later if, if you wanna find that interesting. Um, and we actually chose to go with MSINet. Um, but I'm aware I've been just started off there in strong with some Python. Um, but the main bulk of this talk is actually about how we utilize R and made an R pipeline to make use of some of this tech. Um, so it's all very useful knowing where people are looking on your ad, but how do you use this to improve uh, marketing? I also apologize throughout this talk, I've got a really sore throat. So if I pause to take a drink, <laughs> please just enjoy the slide or prepare a question you might ask later. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, but so if we start off with um, where we're starting with the pipeline. So say you have this raw image here. Now this is an example of a sky ad. And what you're gonna get from the saliency model um, is this black and white heat map. So this doesn't look as pretty as the one that I showed a minute ago. Um, but um, how do you produce a nicer looking heat map out of that? So here is this uh, heat map like I showed a minute ago. Now this is done using R. R is like my primary language that I like to use. and <clears throat> Sorry. R is um, the primary language that I like to use and done using the raster package and um, ggplot. Um, and oh, sorry, <laughs> just struggling with my voice. Um, so if you treat this saliency black and white output,
Okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry there. Um, I apologize for that. Um, but if you treat this black and white output like a data frame, so that's how I like to look at images when analyzing images in R. Um, so if you have this as a data frame or a matrix, where say it's a 40 by 40 pixel image, you might have 40 columns by 40 rows. And then you can look at this um, just like you would anything else. Sorry, just pause. Cool, so <laughs> I think I can go again. Um, I'm not too sure where um, everything was lost there. Um, but, okay, cool. So I was basically saying if we um, treat the saliency model output like um, a matrix, then we can read it into the raster and we can plot it from, um, uh, in uh, ggplot and image magic. <coughs> right, and then, um, and that's all very well and good, but um, as a human, you can see where the image um, attracts attention by this heat map. And you can see that there's attention on the faces and the text. But how do you do this on wide scale and get some sort of numbers out of this? So the answer is we used Google Vision AI to identify um, people, um, logos, prices, various different objects in the image. Um, so this, um, feeding the image through this gives you the bounding box where these objects are. And with that bounding box, you then generate scores to find this share of attention. So you now have some sort of numeric value um, to the different attention on different features in the ad, which can be really useful. And you can analyze this just on its own. So you can say, out of all of, say, Sky's ads, and all of this is representative, it's just an example, but of all of any particular of Sky's ads, there's more attention on people, and this correlates with click-through rate, say. Um, but we were actually looking at this as part of a bigger project, and this was Creative Analytics. So in Creative Analytics, um, here you've got um, a minute to read that for, while I was coughing. I apologize again. Um, but you have the raw ad, and we're adding in these um, visual attention weighted uh, features, so the scores, which is represented here by the heat map. And then you're also adding in these feature detection from Google Vision AI. Um, so we're trying to build the biggest, oh, okay. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> so you're trying to build the biggest picture um, you possibly can to get all the features in order to model them and make predictions. Um, so um, we actually added in uh, color, which uh, I used a package called 
um, uh, color distance, which was used in the biology context, which is quite interesting um, because I did a biology um, degree and I thought it was quite interesting that you could apply um, a package used for a biology context to marketing, um, but you can get color, color information um, as well as all these features. Um, and then um, we modeled it, we used the XG boost model um, and then made predictions and interpreted the model predictions in order to understand how the model was making its decisions in order to predict the click through rate. Um, and here's an example of how that might work. Um, so again, this is just representative um, sort of dummy numbers here. Um, but we've got an ad from Sky. So this is a real ad um, on, um, on, on the um, left here. Um, and it has um, 18 words and a small text error percentage. And one of our findings was actually that you want less words and you want them to be bigger. So we made this simulation using the model to say, what happens if we half the word count and increase the uh, text error percentage. So I didn't actually make this ad. So although it's here in the slides as a representative um, made um, just using uh, paint just for you to see, all you need to do is change a row in the data frame in order to model this and make a prediction. So if you're increasing the word count in the text area and then you make another prediction using the model, and um, in this example, this makes the ad 30% um, more effective um, and increases the click through rate by 30%. But you could do this over a bigger sample um, and then you'd have um, um, uh, average like we have here. Um, and this was just one way that we tried to extract meaning out of what is a black box XG boost model. Um, and this was interesting to do for Sky, but it was a very big project. Um, so how could we use um, the first element that I mentioned, the attention models in um, a different context um, and use it for other things. So, so in um, a real world scenario, you're actually going to see ads in context. Um, so you have these two examples, which are banner ads, which you probably see over the top of um, a news page. Um, here, this is an old example, as you can see, because we've got coronavirus news and we've got Boris Johnson. Um, but um, I, you could just copy and paste this in, like using paint, like I suggested before. Um, but actually, I did this using RVest and WebShot. With RVest, you can scrape the HTML code and then you can insert um, where this banner was before. There was a different ad. Um, and then you can insert a URL for a new image and then um, use WebShop to load the HTML up again and screenshot it. And you have, you could therefore automate this process of putting an ad into a space. When you run this through um, the attention scoring, like before, that's exactly the same pipeline with R plotting with raster and ggplot. And um, you can see here when there's the race for life and the join now, there's more attention attracted to those um, than in the other ad, essentially, because in the other ad, you can see there's a lot more attention on Boris Johnson. <laughs> um, and you can maybe compare different websites. Um, so the same ad in Yahoo, there's more attention on the rest of the page um, because um, it's quite a hectic page, there's lots going on. Um, so it might be better to place your ads on the ind independent um, as there's less going on, uh, but yeah, it might be more expensive. Um, but the same problem occurs um, as when we were looking um, at the ads initially and we were thinking, well, how do we identify anything in these heat maps? It's nice that we've got a heat map. Um, so what I did, I just a little bit of code uh, that I found in Python. If you, again, treat these images as if they're uh, matrices or data frames, you can identify where the ad is within the screenshot um, just by finding the difference in between the two data frames, basically the raw ad and then the screenshot. So you would be able to identify that in this, um, on this ad, um, this is where it is and there is 50% um, attention on the ad compared to the screenshot. Um, 
this is the same concept of before when we um, identified where the people were using Google Vision AI, but this time you're just identifying where the ad is on the page. Um, and you might have something like this, which analyzes the attention on different creatives, maybe on the same web page, or maybe it could be different web pages. Um, so this um, could be an interesting analysis to do with the use of R, you can automate it, which is pretty cool, and a bit of Python, obviously, um, to try and work out what's the best context for your ad. And then the next and last use case I'm going to talk about is on web pages. So here's two stills from uh, Cancer Research UK. One's mobile and one's desktop. So let's add the um, attention over the top of that. Um, and I was quite interested in the donate section. So you can see the donate button um, here. And when you're on a charity's website, the donate button is quite crucial. Um, and I noticed in the uh, desktop version, there's not too much attention on this donate area. And as your eye goes down the page, you're probably going to be attracted further down the page and maybe miss it. Um, so I had a little bit of a play around. Um, you can see on this mock-up, I literally, this time I did use uh, paint just to just to edit it, um, just to sort of crop and move it. And I just switched over these two sections. So you can see now that the donate is on the other side. And it was just a bit of a mock-up to say, what happens if I move it? And does that change the attention? And the answer is, yes, it does to some extent. So you've got a journey down the page now from the Cancer Research UK logo down through the donate and then like down the page. Um, so you're maybe less likely to miss it, but maybe in the future, if you put the donate icon inside this dark uh, semicircle, that might be the best place for it. But this was just an illustrative example. Um, you could do this with other web pages. You could do it as a bit of a test. Um, it doesn't always have to be related to a big analysis or in another big XGBoost model like the first Sky example of creative analytics was. So just to finish up, my voice has got a little bit better now. I apologize for the uh, coughing. Um, I'm sorry if that came through quite loud on the audio there in Brighton. Um, but just to summarize, um, these visual silency models are open source and really useful for getting insights um, in terms of the heat map. But you do need to put them into some sort of pipeline, whether it be R or Python, in order to understand uh, what they're showing you. Um, you can then combine all these features um, from these visual saliency models or from the Google Vision AI to locate different uh, features. Um, you can model them in order to predict the success of the future advert um, and understand that model in order to um, make predictions on how to make better adverts. And then using the attention scoring, um, you could put adverts in context to see how real, real world users might see them and how can they can attract attention away from the web page. And then lastly, you could also use this in the context of web page design. Um, thank you for listening. Um, I am open to any questions. Um, thank you very much, Ethan, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of everybody watching here and at home. Um, thank you for plowing through with your illness as well and still giving us a fantastic talk. I'm conscious of your voice and I don't want to use it too much. So I'll have a couple of questions and then maybe if there's more, we can send them over to you to answer at a later date and we can give the answers back to the community. Uh, we'll start with the online audience. Alex, is there anything coming through from the audience online? Oh, my goodness. Hi, Ethan. Um, so can I just fire off a question for you? Yeah, go for it. Perfect. Um, so given that the project utilised both R and Python, how do you find working with both languages side by side and integrating them into the same product? Cool, yeah. Um, 
I think that's uh, an interesting question. Um, I I really enjoy working with R. That's my primary language, but I did find that some tasks were easier in Python. So I think it's really useful to be able to utilize um, a specific language for a specific problem. Um, lots of the machine learning um, in terms of the saliency modeling is done in Python. Um, so given uh, cloud technology, it's quite easy to use a Docker image and put particular code somewhere that you want it. Um, you could put it in cloud function is um, could be useful, or you could put it on a VM and you could, uh, we then are able to run that code in isolation. Um, and then it just produces an output, which I like to use in R because I find R easier to sort of manipulate on the fly. And then I leave these bits of Python to sort of run on their own accord. I don't have to worry about them too much. So that's how I like to deal with it best. Um, Brilliant. Uh, any questions in the room for Ethan? Anything else from the online audience, Alex? Uh, Should we take one? Okay. Um, um, hi, Ethan. Where do you see this work going in the future? Cool. So um, I think it would be great to um, run this um, over multiple sort of brands or multiple contexts. You could make predictions um, based on huge numbers of ads because there's so many things available. Um, I do think it does have a, a decent way to go in terms of the accuracy of some of the predictions, uh, to sort of caveat the, the work there. I don't think it's completely finessed yet. Um, the machine learning models are still like, there's still things coming out, there's still developments in um, the deep learning side of things and how we process uh, these images. So I think keeping up to date, but that is it's quite important when we're building our own models. Um, but I think it would be great to have wide scale analysis of which brands are best to place in which placements on, on web pages, because I don't think that there's enough information on where a particular advert is placed. I think brands find that very hard to track. There's been cases of a brand seeing an advert placed out of complete context on a, ran on a web page that has nothing to do with their brand. I think it would be great if that could be trackable and if it could be quantified in some way. Um, so we, it would be good if the, it could be used in that context in the future. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ethan, for answering a couple of questions from our online audience. If anyone else does have any questions, do feel free to send them through to us at Brighton R and we'll happily put them to Ethan. But one more time, can we all give Ethan a massive hand for sharing his talk, particularly unwell? <laughs> thank you. So thank, thank you again, Ethan. Um, for those of you that are here in the room, we are going to take a, a two-minute break because we're going to have an in-person speaker. So we've just got to change the tech setup. So if you want to get yourself another drink, um, if you want to step outside for a minute for some air, and then we'll be back in a couple of minutes. For those of you online, again, we'll take a, a short break while we sort out the tech and see you in two.
Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, if you're in the room, we hope you are well refreshed from the uh, two-minute break. Welcome back to everybody that's joining us online on YouTube as well. Uh, our second talk this evening is from Lincoln. Lincoln is a lecturer at the University of Sussex. When he walked in this evening, I said, Lincoln, what can I say to introduce you? Give me a, a fun and exciting fact. And he couldn't think of anything. He said, the most fun and exciting thing about me is that I turn up in my academic gown to give lectures sometimes. I thought, well, I can't really say that. And then two minutes ago, before the talk, he said, oh, I've thought of something. I went to university with Hadley Wickham. It's like, I mean, that is the most fun and exciting fact you can say to anybody at an R event. So, um, welcome to Lincoln, Hadley Wickham's best mate. Thanks, Jeremy. Is this, uh... Okay. Um... So when Jeremy uh, asked me to, to give this talk, well, he basically, he was looking for people to give talks and, and he suggested that I talk about package development, but he didn't really give me much more uh, of a remit about what I should actually be talking about. So when I was coming up with what to, what to talk about, I was a little bit uh, worried about exactly what level I should pitch this at, because there's a lot that you can talk about when you talk about package development, but I thought, you know, because I'm primarily an educator, what I would do is I would aim my talk at the beginner who is just starting out with package development and wants to write their first package. Uh, and so what this talk will be will be a little bit of a guide to how to do that, how to write your first package, and a little bit of a resource that you can use if you want to uh, get started with package development. So there's a QR code there. You can point your phone at that and you can get access to these slides. There's a bunch of links in the slides that you can click on if you want to know about packages that can help you with package development, or if you want to have a look at some of the packages uh, that I have made. Um, so like I've said, uh, there's a lot of things you can talk about when it comes to package development. Some of the more advanced topics might be uh, to do with ours uh, OOP system, which uh, is very unique and strange among programming languages. Uh, I could have talked about uh, including code from other languages into our packages. Uh, this is something that I do quite a bit of. Uh, so I have uh, a couple of R packages that are actually, they actually run Rust underneath the hood. Uh, these are for kind of high performance tasks where running it in straight R is not gonna be fast enough. Uh, I'm also a big fan of code testing and writing good unit tests. So I could have talked about that. Uh, or uh, about CI, CD pipelines, and there's so much more. But I thought I would leave some of these advanced topics for a later date and instead aim this at the beginner who wants to get started with their first R package. Okay, so you might be thinking, well, there's a bunch of R packages out there. Uh, they uh, do what I need them to do. What do I need to make my own R package? Well, I think the primary reason for why you might want to make an R package yourself is if you have a collection of scripts or functions that you find yourself using often, then it's a good idea to wrap them up in an R package. It makes it easy for you to use them. It makes, you easy, it makes it easy for you to share them. If you have tooling that you've built within your company, wrapping it up in an R package allows you to share it between different, uh, different developers within, within the company, right? Also, simply, the, simply just sourcing files uh, to load up functions can clutter up your uh, environment. This is particularly true if you're using RStudio interactively. Uh, all those functions are just gonna be dumped into the global new space and you just, it's gonna add a lot of visual noise to your interface, which is really not ideal. Um, also, if you have packages, if you have code that relies on, uh, say, uh, compiled code from other languages, so like I said, I make R packages that actually run Rust underneath, uh, it's pretty difficult to use those packages um, or to use those functions unless you wrap them up as a, as a package. Um, and some things like, uh, like creating your own HTML widgets for our markdown documents, which is an another thing that, that I, I like to do, it's pretty difficult to use that code unless you put it in an R package. So an R package is gonna be a really useful way to put together stuff that you might be doing already, uh, but in a way that makes it uh, easy to share, easy to maintain and easy to use. 
So what can you put in an R package? Literally anything. So it can be helper functions for processing your data. It could be templates that you use for your uh, reports within your company. So we have a bunch of templates that we use for our teaching materials uh, at the University of Sussex. So we have a, um, a, uh, a department or a methods teaching group uh, GitHub uh, organization where we have uh, some of these packages on there. Um, it could be uh, packages for particular statistical functions. So I, I'm particularly interested in Bayesian statistics. So I have a couple of packages that allow you to perform various kinds of Bayesian analyses. So just to give you a range of the kinds of packages that, that I've built. So uh, I have a package that I use specifically that contains Learn R tutorials for teaching R to undergrads um, in their first year. Uh, I have a couple of Bayes, uh, Bayesian statistics packages. So I have a package called Bayes Play, which is just a, a lightweight modeling syntax for uh, performing various kinds of Bayesian analyses. Um, I have another Bayesian correlations package for performing um, Markov Monte Carlo estimates of, of correlations. Um, and then I have a, a couple of packages I use for teaching. So one of the things about being at a university is we don't have any money uh, when it comes to uh, server hosting. Uh, and so on our online teaching documents, I like to have uh, some comment boxes so students can leave comments. Uh, and usually you would back that up with some kind of server that would be, that would be hosting or collecting those comments. We don't have any money to do that. So I have a, a, an R package called Commenter, which allows you to add comment boxes to R Markdown documents and it's backed up by Google Sheets. So it doesn't cost anything to run. Um, so, you know, you, these are some things uh, where there's a need uh, there's an R package to be, to be built. Okay, so on to package development itself. So one of the great things about R uh, relative to other languages, uh, in particular, I'm thinking about Python, uh, is that uh, R packages all have a very clear structure and there is only one set of tool, or well, there's only one system for uh, building packages and managing package dependencies. This is unlike a language like Python, where it is, if you've ever tried to make a Python package, you'll know that there's a number of tools available to you. There's a number of different build systems. In recent years, it's kind of been getting a little bit better, but uh, Python is still a mess. R uh, is not like that at all. There's just one set of build tools uh, and one structure for packages. So all packages are gonna look are pretty much the same, they're gonna have this set structure. Uh, and there's also one canonical repository for getting packages from uh, called CRAN, uh, uh, which has existed pretty much as long as the language itself. Um, so actually CRAN has existed before R got to version one. I think CRAN has been around since the late 90s uh, and version one of R only came out, I think in 2000, uh, where, um, where when it comes to uh, the kind of canonical repository for, for Python packages, it, it came into existence nearly 15 years after the language came into existence. So things are a lot, a lot more fractured in language like Python, but that's not the case in R. So developing packages in R is actually super easy, right? Because of all this, uh, um, you know, uh, well-developed tooling around it. Okay. so. Like I said, this is gonna be a tutorial on how to make an R package, so let's make an R package. Uh, and to get started with making an R package, there's really two packages that, are, that I find to be the most useful uh, to allow you to scaffold your R package and to be able to add in certain features to it, like uh, how you manage your dependencies. And this is the DevTools package and the use this package, right? There's a number of other packages that are quite useful as well. Um, Things, packages like package down for building documentation, uh, test that for building unit tests, uh, linter for linting your code, uh, and styler for formatting your code. But dev tools and use this are really the two key packages that I always reach for when I'm building a new R package. Now use this has a great function called create package. And it is as simple as running that function to get the scaffold that you need for an R package, right? Uh, you can just run that function by itself and it will just create the scaffold or you can pass some arguments to that. Um, 
that are going to fill out that scaffold a bit for you. So here's just an example of me running that function uh, in the, the fields argument. You can just pass that a list where you can give the package title. Uh, you can give the package name. Uh, you can give a little bit of a description about what that package does. Uh, and then you can specify uh, the author uh, and uh, the maintainer, or in package uh, lingo, the creator, right? So that is uh, going to then fill out uh, your uh, package skeleton, uh, and it's going to create a number of files for you that are going to be uh, part of the core of what makes an R package an R package. Right, so after you, you run this function, you're going to get some files. You're going to get a description file. And that is going to have information about the license that's associated with your package, any package dependencies, uh, who the, the maintainer is, uh, the name of the package, the description of the package, et cetera. Right? And that's going to be created automatically, uh, not filled out with all of those details, but filled out with some of those details uh, that you've put in uh, into that create package uh, call. It's going to create a namespace file. And the namespace file is going to have a list of all the functions that your package exports. Uh, and then it'll also create a R folder for you. Uh, inside that R folder, you'll be able to stick in any R code that you want to be part of that package. Right? You can edit that description file uh, by hand. I don't recommend it. Uh, the use this package has got a number of helpful functions that, as, that are going to allow you to do that uh, to create changes to that uh, description file. Uh, and you can also uh, edit that namespace file by hand as well, but I do not recommend doing this. Instead, there's a package called uh, Roxygen, which allows you to add documentation, uh, and that will also manage your namespace file for you. And I'll show you a little bit of how, of how you do that. Right. But the first thing you should do uh, after you've created that scaffold is you should add a license. Right? And so use this has got a bunch of uh, functions that allow you to add various kinds of licenses. So whenever you put code on the internet, you should put a license uh, with it. Uh, and uh, here's just an example of how I would add an MIT license to that. Uh, and so I can just use the use MIT license. I can give it my name, and it's going to create a couple of files. It's going to create a license file, um, and it's going to create a license.md file. Uh, these ones for humans to read and ones for CRAN to read, and it's also going to update your description. Uh, if you want help choosing a license, there's a link there. Um, there's lots of things to go into when it comes to choosing a license. I actually think that uh, when it comes to licensing, uh, some of the difference in the kind of community standards around code licensing might explain some of the difference in uptake between Python and R. Um, R code tends to more commonly have a, a GPL license. Python code tends to more commonly have an MIT license. I personally like an MIT license, um, but this is not a talk about licenses. Uh, so adding the license is going to add uh, these files. So you're going to get this license.md file. That's for you to read. And this, uh, this just this plain license file, uh, that is for CRAN to read. It is in a particular format. Um, CRAN, if you submit a package to CRAN and that file is in the wrong format, uh, your package will get rejected. Uh, so uh, just use, use this to do it. Uh, don't try write it by hand. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add uh, a file inside that R folder. Uh, and that is where we're going to put some R code uh, that is going to be the, the code for our package. So I'm just going to add a little uh, greeting function, something nice and simple. So here's just a function called say hello. It just takes one argument called name. Uh, and then it's just going to print out hello to the person uh, who, or to the name that is passed in to that name argument. Now, uh, that is going to go inside that code.r file. And now we can try and uh, build and install and load our package. Um, but we're going to find that it doesn't actually do anything. If we had to try and build it uh, and load it and install it, uh, our package would be, uh, would be pretty useless, even though we have included some R code in there. And the reason for this is because by default, that function is not exported. And so we're going to need to add that function to our namespace file before it gets exported. Now, like I said, you can do that manually, but the better way to do it is to use uh, Roxygen, right? And so 
Uh, Roxygen comes with a bunch of directives, uh, one of them being the export directive. So all these uh, Roxygen directives start uh, like a regular comment in R, except they have an, um, a, uh, a single quote uh, and then an at sign. And so the export directive just is going to tell uh, uh, Roxygen that this is a, a function that you want to export. So you want this function to be available to people when they load the package, right? Uh, and then the DevTools uh, document function is actually going to go through your code, look for these export directives, and update your namespace file. So you can see I'm running it here, and you can see it's updating the documentation, and then uh, it is writing uh, the namespace file, right? So this is now going to uh, allow you to then use that, uh, that function if you, export, uh, if you uh, build and then install that package. But this is really the minimum that you should be doing uh, when you add uh, function documentation. In fact, if you try and submit a package to CRAN that has this as your documentation, it will get rejected uh, because CRAN requires you to have full documentation for, uh, for any exported object. So here is the minimal documentation that you will need for uh, a function. So you'll need a title, and you can just use the title director for that. Uh, a description, uh, and then uh, a which is going to give you a description of what the of what the function does. A details block, which is going to give you more detail on the usage, and you can actually put in a R code chunk right in there, uh, so, and that will actually uh, then when it generates the document, it will run that R code and use that as an example uh, uh, as a as a usage. Uh, then you also need to list all the parameters or the inputs that it takes using the param uh, directive. Uh, and then you also need to specify what it returns. So even if it doesn't return anything, so in this case, this function just returns null, it doesn't, doesn't return any, any output, uh, you still have to specify that. This returns is a little bit of a weird thing in that um, there's, there's a way of mention in a second how, how, how you can check your R package to make sure that, it's, uh, that it meets the requirements of, uh, for example, CRAN, it will not pick up that you do not have a returns, but CRAN will reject your package if it doesn't have a return. So returns is a bit of a weird thing. It's one of these mystery undocumented things when it comes to CRAN uh, submitting packages to CRAN. And then lastly, the export directive, just to say that I want to export that, that function, right? But you can add so much more to that documentation. Uh, you can add other usage examples. You can cross-link uh, one set of documentation to another set of documentation. If you're uh, using, say, S4 uh, style uh, objects in R, you can give information about what the various slots in the object in the class uh, require. So there's a lot more that you can put in. But this is really the minimal uh, documentation that we, we need for a, for a function. Now, some of the eagle-eyed among you might have noticed that in this uh, function, I'm calling the glue function from the glue package, right? And so that means that I need to add that as a, uh, a dependency. So that means my package depends on another package. My package is not going to be able to run that function unless you have the glue package installed. And so what you, sh what you need to do is you need to tell, uh, you need to update your description to specify that the glue package as a dependency. And so you can do that again manually, or you can use the use this package. It has a couple of functions, one called use package, which allows you to specify uh, dependencies that your package depends on. So in this case, I can just specify that it depends on the glue package. You can also specify the minimum version, or you can just set it to true, and then it will set it to whatever version you currently have installed in your computer. Um, this, uh, you can think, this can be quite important if you think about, if, I don't know if any of you uh, remember before dplyr1 came out, and then when dplyr version 1 came out, there was a bunch of changes that happened and a bunch of things broke. Uh, clearly specifying minimum versions um, can, uh, can help you avoid those kinds of breakages. Uh, and then R also has a number of ways of managing dependencies. Uh, so the default that use package uh, uses is uh, the imports type, which means that if you load your package, if you install your package, any packages listed as imports will be installed as well. There's also uh, another system, that, there's another type that you can use called suggests, uh, and suggests won't do that. So that is really useful for if you have uh, 
if you have uh, dependencies that might might only be safe for your tests. So you only expect other developers to run your tests and you don't expect end users to use it, then you can use uh, a suggests import. And there's a couple of other ones as well. But the default really is, uh, is um, imports and that's what you're gonna want to use 99% of the time. Um, and I should say that there's also another, uh, another one called uh, use uh, dev package, which allows you to add dependencies that are on GitHub and not on CRAN, right? So you don't only have to have dependencies that are on CRAN, you can have GitHub or GitLab or uh, a couple of other different um, repositories as, uh, as dependencies. Now, uh, when it comes to using functions from other packages in your package, uh, there's a couple of things that you have to do. Uh, the first thing is that you have to, uh, well, what I recommend doing is to make sure that you namespace any function calls to external packages. Uh, so for example, you can see in my example, I had glue two colons uh, glue to specify that I wanted the glue function from the glue package, right? Um, this is so that your package knows where, where these other functions are coming from. But sometimes it can get a little bit awkward uh, if you're namespacing all your function calls. So there is a, uh, an import from directive where you can specify that you wanna import particular functions from external packages to be used in your package. Uh, and again, you can do this manually, but there is also a uh, two handy functions from use this that allow you to do this. The first one that you need to run is just uh, this use package doc function, and it'll create a new file uh, where you can list all your import directives. And then you can just use this import, uh, this use import from, where you can just specify the package name and the function name to write to that. And then you'll be able to use these particular functions from external packages without namespacing them. I personally like to namespace all my function calls from external packages, because that way, every time that I call a package that is not a, a function that is not part of my package, I can have a moment to stop and think, do I really need this dependency? Or can I do without it? Can I write the code in another way? Because I think it's a really good habit to get into to minimize your dependencies because that, if you have too many dependencies, it leads to, to fragile code. So I like to you know, stop myself and think, is this really important? I find this a lot with when I'm using things like, I am a huge Tidyverse fan, except when it comes to packages, then I write everything in, in base R, even though I find it, I, even though I don't like base R, just to reduce those dependencies. Okay, so now we have our basic uh, package. We have some documentation written. Um, and now we can just uh, load it, uh, install it, uh, and check that it works. So the first thing that we can run is just this DevTools document again. And that is, again, just going to like update our documentation because we've made some changes to it. And it's going to update our namespace file. And it's going to make sure that everything is up to date. Then we can uh, run this function, uh, this load all function, and that is going to simulate uh, loading, uh, installing and loading our package, right? And there's a couple of options, a couple of uh, arguments to this function uh, that you can set. Uh, one is the export all argument. Now, the export all argument is set by default to true, but you can see I've set it to false. What does that export all do? Well, when export all is set, to true, it'll export all functions from your package, whether you have specified them to be exported functions or not, right? This is really good during development because that means you can test functions that you don't expect the user to call. You can test them out yourself as the developer. But if you want to simulate what it will be like for the end user, so you only want the, the functions that you have explicitly said should be exported to be exported, you can set export all to false, right? And then that will simulate installing and loading the package and you can make sure that it behaves in the way that you want it to behave. Are the functions available? Do those functions work, right? But you can also install the package for real um, just with this install local function and that will install the, fun the, the package that is in your uh, local directory. Uh, and so that's basically what we need to do to, to, build, uh, to build a package now, there's a couple of things that I think are, are good practice uh, when it comes to package development. 
Uh, and the first thing is using Git. So whether you're going to put your package on GitHub or not, not important. You should use Git for version control because it's going to make your life easier. Uh, there is a helper function in, in use this to initialize a Git repository. I don't recommend using this. Um, I recommend using Git from the command line because I think it is good to learn. Uh, and I think it's a, if, you, if you're going to spend any reasonable time writing software, learning how to use Git and all that Git has to it uh, is a good idea. Um, so that will uh, get things set up for you, but I think you should do it yourself. You know, type that code into the terminal. It is, uh, it is good for you. Um, one thing I will recommend from the use this package is uh, if your package is going on GitHub, uh, there is a great function called use GitHub Actions. So if you don't know what a GitHub Action is, a GitHub Action is uh, essentially some code that lives in your GitHub repository that runs uh, on certain triggers. So it might run every time you push code to a repository, or every time you uh, create a pull request, every time you, you make a new release, and it is going to run some code that is going to do some stuff. Um, use GitHub Actions is going to scaffold a GitHub Action for you that is going to check your code. It is going to run some checks to make sure that it's documented, and it is going to run any tests that you have associated with it. This is fantastic because it means that you can just push your code to your repository, and you'll get a little email alert or a little red cross if there is something wrong with it, and a little green tick if everything is working great. And you know we all love green ticks, so this is fantastic. I highly, highly recommend doing this. It's going to check that all your exported functions are documented, that all your dependencies are specified, and it's going to run your tests. Uh, and it's super easy to get set up. You don't need to do anything more than just run that, uh, that function. Uh, GitHub Actions are most useful when it comes to, uh, to running tests, uh, because they will also run all of your tests. And I think the test that package is the best package for testing. Uh, and you can get set up by just using uh, use this, use test that. And that's going to create a, a folder that is going to hold uh, your tests and it's going to scaffold um, some tests for you. And then you can specify individual tests with this use test function, right? I, um, being in academia, I find people, people don't test their code as much as they should. Uh, and it makes uh, life incredibly difficult. Uh, because you don't know when you're going to break stuff. Uh, but code testing is amazingly freeing because you can just refactor your code you, uh, without any worries because you're going to know exactly when something breaks uh, and you're going to know exactly when the behavior of your dependencies change um, because you're going to get tests that fail. And if you have it on a GitHub action, you're going to get an alert when it happens and, you know, it's a... Uh, it's just a freeing experience knowing when things are going to break, so you don't have to worry about, about fragile code. Um, GitHub Actions also have this advantage of uh, they are going to test your code and run these checks in an environment that is different to your environment. So you know everyone's encountered this problem where uh, somebody gives you some code and it doesn't work, and they're like, well, it works on my machine, and then they leave it at that. Um, that's super annoying, uh, but if you have stuff running in a GitHub action, then you're going to be able to uh, you're going to be able to avoid this problem. I also personally test everything locally in a in a Docker image as well. If you are uh, interested in using Docker to uh, test R code and and uh, run checks, uh, this is the the base image that I recommend. Um, it will build a lot quicker than some of the other ones because uh, it will it um, uh, especially when it comes to uh, compiling packages that uh, that need um, that have binaries that need to be compiled, uh, it will pull down the binaries for you, and it saves a lot of time when it comes to uh, building doc images. So that's the that's the one that I that I recommend. Uh, and so now that we have this package, we can share it with the world. Uh, and there's a couple of ways to do this. We can put it on GitHub. Um, then people can just install it with this install GitHub uh, function, or we can put it on CRAN as well. Uh, and then people can install it with install uh, dot packages. Um, now, just a couple of words about putting stuff on CRAN. Uh, anyone can get a, a, a package uh, accepted on CRAN. Uh, 
But there are a couple of requirements. You have to have no warnings or, uh, or errors uh, when you run DevTools uh, check. Um, so this means, for example, that all your functions need to be adequately documented. Uh, it also needs to be able to be built and installed on a wide range of systems. So this is what you would usually expect, uh, like Windows uh, and Mac OS and a couple of different flavors of Linux, but then also some more exotic things like Solaris Unix, right? Which, you know, no one actually has access to. Uh, but this is one of the requirements. Uh, so uh, our hub, there's an R hub package that allows you to test on various uh, systems. Um, and then lastly, uh, if you are going to share your packages, there's a great package called Package Down, which will allow you to add, uh, to create a website uh, and documentation. And you can actually use, the, uh, use this package to create a GitHub action that will automatically deploy that to you, for you to a GitHub pages website. So I use this a lot, especially when I'm writing statistics packages, because I want to be able to add detailed uh, examples and kind of teaching material on how to perform certain statistical procedures that this package, that you know, my package allows. Uh, and so I find that incredibly useful as well. All right, so I think I've gone way over time. Uh, and that is all I'm going to t t <laughs> talk to you about. <laughs> Thanks. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much, Lincoln. I've, I've built a couple of packages in my time. And honestly, I don't think I've ever seen somebody stand up and make package development sound so easy. Uh, have we got any questions in the audience? Any questions from the floor? Oh, we got one. Yeah, I was wondering if you could, it's not entirely related to package development, but I was kind of curious because you work in academia and I was kind of wondering how essential and widespread you're finding skills like using R to be, because in my experience, I've seen it a little bit unevenly distributed. Maybe it's slightly a generational thing. Yeah, I was just wondering on your opinion on that. Thank you. Um, so uh, if you do a psychology degree at the University of Sussex, you will uh, get R from your first week and you will do how many courses? So we have another lecturer, three courses of four. Uh, and, so, and then you'll also be using R to write your, um, your final year dissertation. So, uh, so R skills are, are essential. Uh, you can't get through your, your degree without uh, without learning R. But that's by design, right? We've designed it so that we want students to learn R. Uh, we want them to um, to learn programming, I guess, in general, right? Because it's an incredibly valuable skill, right? Um, and so I don't know if I can slag off psychology degrees. I don't know how useful a psychology degree is. But <laughs> the couple of my current student, former student here. Um, but if we can, if you can leave with something like that, then that, then that's really great. And you're right, it is generational. And when uh, Sussex, there's not many psych departments that have gone full on with R, um, there was resistance. But I think people realize that actually, no, this is really useful. Uh, and when it comes to, say, my teaching at the university, um, I teach R and then I teach, I teach MATLAB. Uh, and next day I'll probably be teaching a little bit of Python. So I'm in a psych department, but you know, most of what I do is teach programming. Um, so yeah. Great. Any more questions in the room? Alex, have we got anything from the online audience? Great. Two questions or one? Hi, Lincoln. Thank you for that. Um, do you have any advice for trying to get a package on CRAN? Is that exactly what you just said? Um, yeah, so uh, to get a package on CRAN, let me just bring this up. So this is the notes from a package that I submitted uh, and the things that they came back with me on. Um, so they want to know... Uh, they want to know that you've tested it right on various systems that you've tried building it. So uh, R Hub is going to be really useful for this. Um, they want to know that you have no errors or warnings or notes. Um, but then there's also going to be things that aren't picked up that the CRAN administrators are going to come back at you at. So I had this thing right to like my license didn't match the template, 
And none of the checks flagged this up, but they came back and they said, no, no, you have to change this. I had another thing where it's like I had um, some printing to the console uh, with uh, some methods um, which uh, is not documented anywhere, where they say you have to change it so that you can suppress, so that the end user can suppress it. Again, this is like an undocumented thing. So my advice to get a package on CRAN is submit it and see what they come back with. Because there's, there, there is stuff that is documented, but then there's like, there's mystery stuff. So, you know. Brilliant. Yeah, it is hard to get packages on CRAN. I think we've got one more online, have we? Wonderful. I could have got up really, couldn't I? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, what are some alternatives to CRAN and GitHub for distributing and publishing R packages? So that's a, that's a good question. So one of the things about CRAN is uh, that CRAN will check your package uh, to make sure that it meets a kind of minimal requirements uh, in terms of documentation and things like that. But they don't check your package for correctness, right? So I write uh, packages for performing certain kinds of statistical tests, uh, and CRAN is not gonna, CRAN doesn't care if like those actually do what I intend them to do, right? Um, so there are some alternatives, and one uh, is uh, the R open sci. So they run a repository, uh, but they also peer review all your uh, or your code. So if you are writing code that is, say, performing particular kinds of analyses and you want somebody to check that for correctness, then R OpenSci is a really great alternative uh, and that will go up onto a R universe repository. But it will also go out to peer reviewers that will check your code and make sure it does what you say it does. And they will look at things like your tests uh, you don't need to have any tests for a package to go onto CRAN, but for our open side, they have they'll they'll check those things and they'll have a little bit more of a stringent criteria. Uh, so I think that's really good, especially if you if you're developing statistics packages as opposed to say packages for uh, theming reports or something like that. Great. Uh, any more questions? Either oh, we've got a question from Paul, and he's at the back again. Everyone's at the back. Hi, should the workflow then for developing packages and submitting to CRAN actually have a step before it, which is submitted to our open sci? Uh, so... Yeah, so I think if you're developing packages, uh, particularly ones that are doing statistics, I think submitting it to our open sci or submitting it to something like the R journal or submitting it to uh, the journal of open source software uh, I think that is a really good step uh, to take before you submit it to CRAN. So, because then you can get like other expert opinions that are actually going to check to make sure that your code does what you say it does, right? Because CRAN, unfortunately, they don't have the capacity to check that. Yeah. Any final questions for Lincoln, either in the room or online? Dean. Yeah. Uh, hello, um, I've never written a package before, but I've written lots of functions. I've got kind of like a mental trigger. If I write some code once or twice, I'll, I'll write a function. Is there a similar thing with the package with, a, with what your sort of mental threshold you would cause you to write a package? Um, so if I call a function more than twice, <laughs> I will put it in a package, right? Um, I agree, if you're writing, if you're you know, if there's a bit of code that you're that you're writing, you know, more than a couple of times, it should go in a function, right? So that you can reuse it. And if you're using a function more than a couple of times, put it in a package. It'll it'll make your life easier. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I'm sure if there's any more questions, um, people can just grab Lincoln before he runs out the door this evening. But once again, can we give a massive thank you to Lincoln for telling us everything he knows about package development? So we've got a couple of announcements before we finish. While I'm letting Charlie mess around with all the tech for one last time before he goes and has a massive lie down after doing this two nights in a row, um, has anybody got any announcements they'd like to make? Anybody hiring for people in R or data science? There we go. 
Cool. There's lots of our jobs around, not just in Brighton. Just thought I'd try and fill the awkward silence with some more awkward silence. There we go. Right. Our next event within the Brighton Art community is in April. We have got a fantastic speaker. He may even be in the room tonight, but I don't want to reveal too much. But turn up in April and find out some exciting R things that you can do. Scan the QR code there to go straight to the meetup page and sign up now. A couple of other events that are happening. I've always said it's not R or Python. It is R and Python. Uh, so we sponsor Brighton Pie as well. Uh, the Brighton Pie meetup group gets together in this venue next Wednesday night. Uh, we're going to have a fantastic talk from Zach at Data Cove. Uh, one of my team members, and he'll be telling us everything he knows about robotics, fish, AI, um, and the world, really. So not an event to be missed. Uh, then we've got some other event. Um, apparently, the talk's rubbish. Apparently, the speaker's even worse. Don't turn up to it. Um, that's happening. That's supported by Silicon Brighton next Friday, um, and God knows what you're going to learn there. So not too much to say about that one. And then we are a community, so we exist as a community, as I mentioned earlier, on Slack, but we also exist on Meetup. If you want to find out about all the events we're running at Brighton R, then please sign up on our Meetup page. That will be the first place that you hear about all of our future events. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram if we're still active, because I certainly don't touch Instagram. I think that's Paul or Simon's um, bag. Uh, and also as a community, I may stand up here every time. It might just look like Brighton R is all me. We've got Paul at the back there. We've got Simon here, who are a massive part in helping to organize these events. Um, and in all honesty tonight, I literally have just turned up. I have done next to nothing to be here. So massive thank you, first of all, to Alex from Silicon Brighton, who's at the back, uh, and Abby from Data Cove, who's done a lot of the hard work. So can we give them a big round of applause for making sure that we are here tonight? And from us, that is it for the first Brighton R of the year. Please join the Silicon Brighton Slack community. Um, as I said, that's where we kind of exist and the conversation carries on when we're not here. And please come back and join us next time in April for more fantastic R talks. Uh, if you want more R stickers, they're still out, so grab them on your way out. Thank you very much for coming tonight, everybody. And we'll see you again soon for an R or Pi meetup. <laughs>